This is on assignment. Hi, this is Imran Siddiqui from VOA's Urdu TV. And I'm Alex Villarreal. I'm an English language reporter, and we are going to take you on assignment. And we're coming at you on a windy day in Washington, D.C., from the rooftop of VOA's world headquarters, just a couple of blocks away from the U.S. Capitol. VOA broadcasts in more than 40 different languages. This program is going to take you behind the scenes of all the stories we do. Think of it as your backstage pass to VOA. Absolutely. We'll take you on the streets of Baghdad and show you stories of hope and danger. VOA goes inside Burma as the wall come down and we show you how female Muslim athletes in the West are trying to keep their faith. So get ready as we go on assignment. Let's go. First up we take you to Iraq where reporter Sharon Bain went on assignment with photographer Ilyas Khan. This is their story on women after war. By Iraqi traditions women are considered the glue that holds society together. They are expected to take care of their families no matter their difficulties. Sadia Jabbar is the widowed mother of five children. Terrorists in 2004 killed one of her sons because he worked for an American company. She was left with little money and a traumatized family. I don't know what to do. The world is collapsing in front of me. I don't know what to do. We started to sell furniture to buy medicine for my sick child. No schools. Everything is bad. And my child is sick. It is worse than death. Jabbar now sells her sewing with the help of a group set up to help women. But she is pessimistic about the future. I'm expecting it's going to get worse. Some of them fear the Americans, but I think it will get worse because of the fighting and the government is not united. Teacher Wamid Marhun has no faith in the government and is not optimistic about what the future holds for her children. The biggest problems are religious conflict, corruption and politics. It's everything. Politics, destruction, instability, lack of security, all of this together. Plus, anyone who comes to the country wants to take the money. Nobody is thinking of the people. Nobody is thinking of us. Women often are the ones taking care of their own families as well as the children of their dead relatives. Human rights activist Sundos Abbas says at the same time, religious groups are eroding women's freedoms. First of all, they are talking about our personal freedoms, what we should wear, if we can work or not, if we can study or not. Women should not go to the universities. Women shouldn't drive the cars. These things are something which is anti-nature in our society. Abbas's brother was shot dead in the sectarian killings of 2006. She fears a repeat of that violence. I think, yes, there, is, there will be more violence in Iraq for the next, at least I'm talking about the near future. It is the future that worries many Iraqis. They question if the government is capable of avoiding the sectarian tensions that brought the country to the brink of civil war five years ago. Sharon Bain, UA News, Baghdad. I'm standing here with Sharon Bain from VOA Central News and Ilyas Khan from VOA Urdu News. They just came back from Iraq. The Iraqi women's story, what made you do that story and what was the most unique aspect that you found in it? I wanted to do the story because usually Iraqi women are seen just as victims. There's, um, if you look at throughout the media, most media just sees them as victims or they're portrayed in the background of the Iraq story and I really wanted to see what the Iraqi women felt about the situation as the American troops were leaving and what their lives were really like. So I picked three women. One was from a poorer, more traditional background. One was from a middle class background. One is a human rights activist, so she had very strong opinions on what was going on. And we just talked to them. We talked to them in their homes and in their offices and try to get them to open up about their experiences. The women were very powerful. They were talking about the things that had affected them uh, in one, her son had been killed by, um, he had received a death threat from Al-Qaeda and he had been killed for working with an American company. And the other one, the woman's brother was executed just for being on the wrong side of, of the religious divide. The women were frightened, uh, the men were frightened. 
I think almost every Iraqi male that we spoke to said yeah. that they had applied for immigration visas. They wanted to get out. There's still a good level of fear in Iraq. It's not a stable place. Did you feel alienated or did you feel like a part of the society while you were working there as a journalist? You know, it's the, we interviewed this 11-year-old girl, this little, little Iraqi girl, and I asked her, do you have nightmares? And she said, yeah, I do. I have nightmares of American soldiers bursting into the house, and I have nightmares of being kidnapped and explosions. That was very hard to listen to. But never did I feel really uncomfortable about being an American there among the Iraqi people that we were with. When we were with people that we had decided to interview and had accepted that we were going to interview them, we were fine. Speaking English on the street, not a good no. idea. So if we speak, spoke English, then uh, we can be target, you know. So what, I mean, if I'm, uh, somebody is talking to me, I look like a southern Iraqi. And she, you know, all wrapped up with her, like, you know, hijab and everything with bulletproof jacket. And uh, but we were very careful. The thing is, like, whenever you go in this kind of situation, you depend on other people's, you know, hands. Like, you cannot make your own decision. If I wanted to make one my own decision and Sharon thinks it's not right, then Sharon says, hey, no, we are not going to do it. I take a step back and I think, I say, all oh, right, she was right. Because you are, if you are out there with a camera and you are noticeable, like, you know, everybody's like, oh, who's this guy? Either it's a gun or camera or whatever. Then we had a driver who was a great guy, wonderful, and he would, you come to a stop and there's a light and all the little kids come up to try to sell you candy or tissues or whatever. He hated that. He absolutely hated it. And I said, what's wrong? And he goes, the kids, when they see your car and they walk by, they can get paid to just slap a sticky bomb on the side of the car and wow. just keep on walking. So it's like very, very, very tense. What's interesting about being a cameraman, for example, Elias has a, carries his tripod on his shoulder. And, and it looks like a bazooka. It looks like yeah, a bazooka. So the yeah. first thing the guy said was, don't carry your tripod that on way. The you know, the, yeah. our driver was like, please don't carry your tripod on the shoulder, carry it this way because of what's happened before where journalists have been killed because it looks like a bazooka. So there are lots of little things that were going on. There you have it, Sharon and Elias. They just came back from Iraq. You can catch a lot of their work on voanews.com. This is On Assignment. Next up, Alex goes on assignment with VOA's Carolyn Persuti, just back from Port-au-Prince. I'm here with VOA's Carolyn Persuti, who recently went to Haiti. It's now been two years since the earthquake that devastated that country, and so Carolyn is here with us. She's going to share some of her impressions from her visit. Carolyn, you know, I know a lot of us, I don't think we'll ever forget the images that we saw after the earthquake struck, and so if you could share with us, paint a picture, so to speak, of the conditions now in the country. You know, it was quite a tremendous earthquake. In 30 seconds, in a 30 square mile area, 300,000 people died. So when you just consider that magnitude, then to go down two years later, you would think that there would be some evidence of some success, some rebuilding. But as an outsider going in, there's still rubble on both sides of the street in Port-au-Prince, which is Haiti's capital. There's still a lot of people in tent cities. 600,000 people still are displaced from their homes. Um, you have shortages of food, shortages of clean water. You have a cholera epidemic now. So Haiti is certainly going through a lot of changes since the earthquake and still trying to bounce back. Talking about that, um, in relation to the government, you know, one of the things that struck me seeing the images that you brought back was this image of the presidential palace, which is still in ruins. You know, how does, how does that reflect how the earthquake affected the government? Exactly. The presidential palace still the same way it looked two years ago. No one has been inside. It's totally inhabitable at this time. They've built temporary facilities for the government right now. There, 15 out of 16 ministries were destroyed in the earthquake, still slowly built building back, but across the street from the Presidential Palace, a tent city. They have an unemployment rate, two out of three do not have formal jobs. So they end up creating their own businesses. Between these two families, they make eight different handicrafts. This family builds stools out of wooden crates. This man, a dollhouse from paper and cardboard. This man paints on the dried husks from a Haitian calbus tree. 
if they do find a need and they create a job around it. And that's truly the heart of the Haitian people. And talking about those people who you met, um, you know, I know as journalists, we try to approach our stories as objectively as we possibly can, but you can't help but be touched and impacted by those people. So were there any particular people who stood out to you? the jewelry maker. She has such talent. She took in her sister's children when her sister died. So she has 13 people living in a three bedroom house on the side of a hill. And her one daughter who helps her the most with her jewelry, Belinda, has a young son herself. And, and it's just so nice to see all these women working on the jewelry together, but yet so many people live in that tiny house. The people are, are wonderful. They're warm, they're friendly. It was, a, it was just a great experience and to tell their stories. I, I felt very special in, in doing that, the fact that I got to tell their stories. And in those stories that, that you did tell, what, what are some of the things that you hope that people take away who, who watch them? Well, I think they'll understand how, even if you have all these setbacks, if you look back in history from Haiti, I mean, there, they are an independent slave colony. That's how they started. And then they were taken over by France. They gained independence from France. Then they went through a series of dictators. Uh, they went through famine. Now this terrible earthquake. Well, thank you, Carolyn. We really appreciate your time today, and we're looking forward to watching some of your reports. So uh, let's go ahead and, and roll one. Haiti's president lives in the elite suburb of Peggyville, painted in the pink and white colors of his campaign. The wealthy neighborhood shares its sidewalks with the poor, left homeless after the 2010 earthquake. Just down the road is Port-au-Prince, the country's capital. The quake's impact, evident here too. The rubble, the foundations, the open drains. Nearly everything here waits for repair. After the earthquake, more than a million Haitians moved to public parks, set up a tarp, and called it home. 600,000 still live in these 10 cities. Why? It's a question for Haiti's president. How do you lure businesses here when the first thing they see when they come out of the airport is a tent city? Yeah, first thing they see with the presidential palace, it's a tent city. That's not all that Haiti is about. Once you leave Port-au-Prince, you see other things. You see beauties, you see wealth, you see a rich, uh, a rich country with humongous possibilities. To show off these possibilities, President Michel Martelly flew some builders north of Port-au-Prince to find land for 3,000 new houses. But it's been a slow process since the quake shattered Haiti's infrastructure and destroyed 17 of 18 government ministries. Gems Des Auguste is with a group demanding land and housing now. But up until now, 21 months after the earthquake, we find the people's living situation has not changed at all. The Martelly administration says it takes time. We are trying to identify homes for these people. So they walk out of the tents and they go to a home. There are new houses for sale in Haiti, prefabricated. We put electrical lights. But even at a price of $5,000, Builder Jean-Marc Louis Ohm says tent city residents cannot afford them. They, they can, they can. But the NGOs or government can buy this and build them for them. That's not the government's plan, though. President Martelly invited VOA to join his presidential motorcade into the central plateau of the country, where the government will build affordable housing. He says it's a major step toward Haitian independence and away from foreign loans. Who will change this country? I'm determined, and uh, the people of Haiti want a better life. The president admits there is much to be done. It's a country where, in 35 seconds, in a 30-square-kilometer area, 300,000 people died. In Port-au-Prince, Haiti, Carolyn Prasuti, VOA News. As Haiti hangs on to hope in the aftermath of the quake, Alex has another story that talks about the winds of change in a country where democracy has been suppressed for many years. We're talking about Burma, which has seen a series of reforms recently. I had the chance to talk to a journalist who witnessed those changes firsthand. So let's go on assignment. 
It is my pleasure to introduce you to Kin So Win. Kin is an editor in VOA's Burmese service. She also is a former Burmese diplomat. She recently traveled to Burma for the first time in 15 years. She was the first VOA Burmese journalist to make that trip since 1995. So Kin, you being back in your home country for the first time in so long, what was that like for you personally? As soon as, you know, they realized that I am a reporter from Burmese service, VOA Burmese service. They all jump and just surrounded me and you know, they interview me just like, you know, like I, as if I am an alien. I was in the Burmese news uh, journals, you know, several new news journals. This image of you that I saw in your reporting of you walking freely through parliament, talking to members of parliament, talking to these lawmakers, what was that like for you to, to see this shift in person? This is the very first time I can see the, the real people in the parliament. This is the very first time for the Burmese people seeing that we do have the government because before that we only have the dictator. You did have some moments, like at the airport for example, where you weren't met maybe with open arms. Can you talk about that experience? That day, you know, the U.S. envoy for Burma, Derek Mich succeed. Mitchells, uh, holding press conference at the VIP complex. And after his press conference, I was trying to do stand-up right in front of the VIP complex. And all of a sudden, the security guy came over to me and then, hey, you are not allowed to shoot anything here. This is the sec for security reason. I said, this is an airport. And the other TV crew, like their local TV crew, they are there before me. And I just stand up their space, you know, so, and then they said, no, no, you are not allowed. One of the important moments of uh, your trip, you interviewed a Burmese pro-democracy leader, Aung San Suu Kyi. Um, you talked to her about this issue of political prisoners, which is still very much an issue of concern in terms of the international community and how it views Burma. Um, what did she say to you? Did she say anything to you that surprised you? This is the, uh, the question everybody wants to know. By talking to each other and by sorting out our differences, that could help us to hasten the release of political prisoners. She is not bargaining with this, you know, issue with the government. But if the government wants to do more to, for reform, they have to release the political prisoners. If there is a political prisoners in Burma, there won't be any national reconciliation in Burma. That's what she said. In terms of reforms, another thing, something pretty remarkable happened on your trip. You know, one of the things that a lot of Burmese faced under the military government was censorship. Not being able to access certain sites on the internet, VOA's site was one, YouTube was one, um, but that seems to be shifting. And can you talk about your experience when you were, were there? I was very fortunate to uh, cover one event, a very uh, important event in, in Napidaw, the capital of Burma, That's which is the International Democracy Day event on the 15th of September. And when I went there and I talked to the ministers and the parliament leaders, and then they are talking about my reports. And they said they followed my report since I arrived there and they appreciate what I report about Burma has been changed. Mm. And then all of a sudden I said, I couldn't log on to our, you know, visit our website. And they said, is it true? Go and check when you go back to the hotel. and. When I went back to hotel and when I, I visited our site, the blog wow. is lifted. So the whole country since then, they, you know, our audience, our viewers, they can visit our websites. So again, we'd like to thank you, Kim So Win, for joining us today, for talking to us. We look forward to more reports from VOA's Burmese service. I was watching this interview and I was curious about one thing, access to the Burmese website. Was it like because of Democracy Day or is it still ongoing? Well, we actually talked about that with VOA's Matthew Bays. Matthew is our online managing editor, and he looks at the traffic to the various VOA sites. So let's check out what he had to say. Prior to September, there was almost no traffic coming in from Burma, probably 40 or 50 visits a day. But after the first week of September, there was a dramatic rise in traffic. Uh, as we now see thousands of visits uh, a day coming in from the country, and there seems to be consistent growth ever since then. Alex, as you know, a lot of the correspondents at VOA try to come up with inspirational stories, inspiring stories for a global audience. Tala Hadavi is from Persian News Network. She concentrates on women empowerment. This is a story about the empowerment of Muslim women in the West. Great, let's take a look. 
17-year-old Zainab Hamoud has a brown belt in Taekwondo and dreams of one day making it to the Olympics. But unlike her sister Rana, Zainab chooses to wear the Islamic headscarf or hijab. This became a problem four years ago. The team's hard work, passion and hopes were dashed when the Taekwondo Federation of Quebec expelled them from a tournament in 2007. The reason? Their hijabs were considered unsafe. I was really disappointed because I trained really hard for the tournament. When I found out we were expelled, I lost all my motivation to continue. Civil rights supporters and sports enthusiasts around the world were enraged. Elham Sayyid Javad was one of them. In my opinion, every individual, no matter their religion, should have the same rights as anyone else in society. I mean, sports was made to reunite people. Javad was an industrial design student at the time, so she decided to take on the problem as one of her school projects. Javad spent countless hours with the Humud sisters taekwondo team and with pattern maker Latifa Bukenda to make the best product possible. Ultimately, they hit upon a design that worked and a fabric that was stretchy, breathable and dried quickly. Called a Resport On, the garment was an immediate hit. Javad's invention came at an opportune time. A year later, in response to pressure from the Taekwondo community, the World Taekwondo Federation changed its rules to allow for head coverings. The Montreal Muslim Taekwondo team was able to compete again. Javad thought she was just helping Zainab and her teammates. But when an investor approached her about marketing the product, things changed dramatically. In January, her sports hijab became available to athletes all over the world. She has been busy ever since. My days start at 2 a.m. when my phone goes off with an email from an athlete from the other side of the world. I turn it on and read the email, get happy, and go back to sleep. Now I'm here with the producer of the story, Tala Hadavi. Tala, why did you pick up this particular story? I mean, the hijabi designer. What was the idea behind that? So I was just, you know, reading something online, and I come across this Iranian woman, Elham Sayyid Javad, that we saw in the story. She's a woman that lives in Montreal, and she was an engineering student, and um, got really close to the, to this Taekwondo team that had all Muslim women on the team. And they had the same issue. They were banned from the competitions also in the summertime, three years ago in 2008. And so when they were banned, um, she was like, I have to help these kids. I love them, I care about them, I want them to be able to compete, I want to empower them through my sport. And so she came up with this and, and that's how it came about. And I went there and did a story on her. When you spoke to the subject, the designer, uh, what do you think was the impact on her considering the impact that she's made on other people, thousands of people across the world now who can be uh, participating in these sports because of the design that she made. She was telling me, you know, Tala, from 2 a.m. until the next 2 a.m., 24 hours a day, I get emails all the time, phone calls, text messages, social media messages, and she said, people are so appreciative about the fact that I have been able to design this and they really appreciate the fact that they can play their sport because of this headscarf. And it's a very different kind of headscarf, you know, as you can see in the story, it's a t-shirt attached to it. And then once you put it on the t-shirt, you have the sort of the hoodie in, in front of you and then you pull it over your head and then you tie it in the back also. There's no chance for another athlete, an opposing athlete, a competitive athlete to pull me or push me in any way where I feel strangled or anything like that, which was the concern of FIFA originally. This is Tala Hadavi from Persian News Network, only at Voice of America, and you are on assignment. Alex, this is it. It was a pleasure to be here. As you know that I do a lot of broadcasting to Pakistan. It was an opportunity for me to work with, with so many different correspondents at VOA, including yourself. Yeah, it was great to work with you too. It was great to hear from everybody around the building, all these interesting stories from around the world. I can't wait to do this again next week. I hope you will join us next week. They have to join us because we'll be talking a lot about the 2012 election. Exactly, following up with all of our political reporters who have been on the scene. So please join us next week when we take you on assignment.